On this week's episode of the I-501CU, the podcast for nonprofit board members, I have the pleasure of interviewing Lauren Diorio, who's the president and executive director of the Community Foundation for Ocala Marion. Lauren has a very interesting background. She's actually a finance major, started off in accounting, and as you will hear, became ultimately the CEO because of her passion for her community. So join me as I have a great conversation with Lauren Diorio. Hey everybody, this is Michael Corley. Just wanted to let you know, we are now sending out a weekly, very brief newsletter, tips, tricks, pointers to nonprofit executives. That includes both board members and CEOs, and executive directors. If you're interested in receiving this, please go to thecorleycompany.com forward slash newsletter and you can sign up. Once again, that's thecorleycompany.com forward slash newsletter. Well, welcome everybody to the I-501C, the podcast for nonprofit board members. I'm Michael Corley, and it gives me great pleasure today to interview Lauren Diorio. Lauren is the president and executive director for the Community Foundation for Ocala and Marion County in the northern part of the state. Lauren, welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so uh, I'm originally a Kentucky girl came from Louisville, Kentucky. Notice I said Louisville. That's right. You pronounced it correctly. Uh, exactly. Um, but I uh, started out in um, public accounting. My degree is in finance. Sounds really odd, uh, but uh, loved what I did when I was in public accounting. But this was prior to starting a family, getting married. Um, realized that I probably wouldn't go back to public accounting and but use my resources in a way that I could impact the community, especially when we moved from upstate New York to Ocala, Florida, uh, fell in love with Ocala, Florida. It's a wonderful place to live. And so, you know, our motto is, you know, you live here, you're going to give here. So we've brought our kids up to really understand that um, you're going to be active in a community by giving back. So um I, I was even while I was having the children and, you know, my husband was busy doing his thing. Um, I was actually doing volunteer work, doing work in the sense that if a nonprofit was struggling with financial management, I would go in and help them with, inter, you know, fixing internal controls. We talk about budgeting. We talk about financial statements. Uh, I worked very closely with um, a foundation called the ARC Marion Foundation as they were trying to build capacity. It was an all volunteer board. They supported the other uh, nonprofit that um, worked with developmentally disabled individuals. And so it was the fundraising arm. So I helped them kind of get some things in place, helped them hire their first executive director, uh, and then started moving into working with the uh, school district and served on the public education foundation here locally until uh, then Mr. Yancey, Superintendent Yancey, uh, was looking to add a development director to the district foundation. And I helped him write the job description. And lo and behold, he's like, why are you not applying? And I was like, makes sense. So I spent eight years there before this position opened up. And honestly, it was something that just spoke to me, spoke to my heart. Uh, I love nonprofit work. It gave me the opportunity to see everything that was going on in our community, to work with those nonprofits um, and really, really get them to understand that they are a business. And while some things are a little bit different, they still have an obligation to their donors to make sure that they're very transparent and they're providing a return on investment. So here oh. I am. Yeah, here you are. What an interesting background. But and one of the reasons we're speaking, Lauren, is a, a mutual friend, Kevin McDonald, introduced us, and he shared with me something you wrote called "Roadmap to Success," which are recommendations for nonprofit excellence. Love it. I've had a chance to read it. It's a wonderful, I guess, tool. You you call it. The, Why did you write that? Let, let's talk about that a little bit. So it actually started because of the group of nonprofits that we pulled together here at the Community Foundation. Um, we have something called the Nonprofit uh, Resource Center, where the Community Foundation is situated. And within that resource center, there is the Nonprofit Business Council. Initially, it started at um, our local chamber and then was kind of birthed out of there into the community foundation made sense because you know we're working with donors here at the community foundation that are looking to place funds um 
what better way to reassure your donors that they're investing in something of quality than to help those nonprofits bring themselves up to being a good, solid investment, right? So um, we got together and realized that for whatever reason, we could not find standards in the state of Florida for nonprofits. Uh, you could look at every other state and there was either some component of it, but we couldn't find anything. And so that's when the group decided we need to get together and start bringing the experts in, looking at what quality standards are for other states and seeing if we can incorporate some of it. And lo and behold, we came up with this document that we wanted to call the Roadmap to Success, um, where we you know, play on destinations, uh, mile markers, uh, but the tool is to be utilized by the nonprofit in helping them create a nonprofit organization that has beautiful structure as a business. And it focuses on things like um, financial management, governance, um, fundraising. We've added a few areas that we didn't necessarily see in some of the other ones like technology. Somebody said, why do you have this technology component in there? And the reality is in this day and age, there's no for-profit, nonprofit, or government entity that does not rely on technology. And with that, over time, you know, you may have a great setup now with computers or whatever. You're going to have to replace those. So there has to be a technology plan. Cybersecurity is becoming huge. What are you doing to mitigate, you know, risk there? How are you protecting your data? Is it stored off site? Is it stored in the cloud? Um, what are your retrieval and backup procedures? So, you know, we felt like so much of what nonprofits are doing, they rely on the technology that they've got to have. That is a huge component of running that business. So those are some of the areas within that roadmap to success. But ultimately, we encourage the nonprofits, read it, look at it. In there, you'll see things that are non-negotiable. If you look in the governance section, you know, of course, we cite statute in the state of Florida. You have to have at least three board members. There's no way to get around that. You must do that. But there are some areas in blue that are stretch goals that the board should be working towards as they're building capacity. So we encourage them to continually review it and use it. And when you're talking about the term excellence, maybe, maybe that's my term, but I know you, I hear you talk about it as well. Is, how should excellence be defined for a nonprofit board as, well, as they I, look at, as they look at their organization? Well, I think excellence is, you know, we go back to the basics of um, what does a nonprofit do? How do they garner their revenue? Right. Um, I had a community leader say to me, ugh, that's those nonprofits, they're always asking for money, you know, and I'm like, well, if they, 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 they can't run anything if they're asking. I said, that's their job. I said, that's the basics of how nonprofits raise revenue, right? They depend on the generosity of donors, whether that's individuals, businesses, or even grant funders. And in some cases, some of them receive client fee for service through government funding, right? So um, if they're not asking for money, that's a problem, right? Right. So from a board standpoint, it's important that you are a nonprofit set up in a way that you have done your due diligence to make sure every facet of how that nonprofit runs, whether it's human resources and, hey, do we have great employee handbook and policies for that, all the way down to um, are, are we doing things like have a really strong set of internal controls to make sure that there's no chance of fraudulent activity um, so that that donor knows when I write that check, that money's being used the way it, it needs to be uh, utilized. So I think excellence, when you look at that and how a board strives for it, they need to think of it in terms of, am I really running this nonprofit or a part of a nonprofit that has true transparency, that runs like a business, that's following all the rules? Um, and I think that's why donors respond very well to nonprofits that are very transparent and have a strong board that's willing to hold the staff and the executive director of that nonprofit's feet to the fire to make sure that they're performing in the right way. 
Um, donors are the ones that actually, you know, they're, they're almost, they're the customers, right? Um, I told somebody the other day, you know, if you look at for-profit versus nonprofit, they're doing something similar, right? The product for a for-profit is either a service or an actual physical, tangible item, right? Um, with the nonprofits, a little different. The the product is really that intangible um, mission, right? You're selling them on the mission. So if something goes wrong in a for-profit business with the product and a customer has a bad experience, that customer has the, the, the agency has their, or the for-profit business has the opportunity to make it right, right? So nonprofit's a little different. If, if a donor has a bad experience, they hold on that to that a little bit longer because it's their philosophy. That's why they invested in you is they had a passion and they trusted you. It's harder to build that trust back. So um, nonprofits have a lot of work to do in that department. Um, fund development is huge. And we've been working with um, Edith Bush Foundation. Uh, and they have told us the same thing that we are seeing. There's not a lot of fund development directors um, in the state of Florida. So every time you get one really good, nine times out of 10, you're going to have a university or college come in and steal them because they utilize that method. Um, and it's um, and it's really kind of a skill set, too, if you think about it. Um, you got to have somebody with the right personality to connect with your donors that know the signals when to make that ask. Um, and some people aren't comfortable with even making an ask. So, Oh, yeah. Yeah, I understand that. You said something there. It was a couple of things that was very interesting. And going back to the role of the board, they are the stewards. And you, I think your mm -hmm. statement was, do they understand to hold the feet to the fire? But it's also to create that environment, a good governance yeah. of transparency, because they're the stewards of the public good. I think right. I wrote a blog on that, right? That's why a board exists in the in the nonprofit space. Can you just talk a little bit about that? I know you're passionate about boards and board excellence. Yes. I mean, uh, we have in about a month and a half ago experienced a nonprofit that, um, you know, provided a very critical service in our community and uh, they had never had an audit done, right? So um, they decided they were going to venture into that space. And it just so happened the office manager that was handling all the finances um, for years finally came clean that there was money being taken. So we had a lot of feedback from people in the community saying, see, this is why nonprofits are the way they are. And I'm like, guys, it could happen in any for-profit situation, right? But I said, here's the thing that I learned after reading the article. It became very clear to me that the board did not um, execute their responsibility because my question was, if this was happening for over six or seven years, um, and the executive director didn't even, said they didn't even know that this was going on, who was signing the checks? And then if you look at financial statements, at some point you would have seen a line item that would have been out of whack. It may not have been the salary or whatever. It may have been in some other area. But that's why it's so important for the board to be very active actively involved, what they don't realize is that they are responsible so much so that um, that's why it's emphasized that every nonprofit should carry DNO insurance. That's directors and officers insurance, right? And um, somebody had said to me, well, that's not a big deal. I mean, why would you even need that? And so I tell them I had a real life experience with a situation where we were closing a nonprofit and it was a fundraising arm of another organization. They thought that if they could force the fundraising arm to close, the money that was in that foundation would automatically go to them because of the dissolution clause, right? Because most dissolution clauses say that after all liabilities are paid, then the money goes, you know, somewhere. And they knew that it would go to the parent, to the oversight, the bigger um, operating part portion. Um, but what had happened is because the foundation had been raising money and that the donors gave that money for specific intent and purposes, it was restricted. It actually sat on the balance sheet as a liability, right? 
So regardless of whether that entity closed, the liability was already there and it had to go to be utilized for what it was for. And so when they figured that out and there was no money, then the lawsuit happened. But because there was DNO insurance, the good news is the insurance company came in and they covered every board member. Had there not been that DNO insurance, every single board member and their spouse, they would have attached a lawsuit to each and every one of those board members. So I always tell anybody coming, whether it's leadership of Calamarian or just general donors that are interested in becoming involved with the nonprofit, if you're interviewing with a nonprofit, you better make sure to ask them, are they carrying directors and officers insurance just to protect you? And then they need to really think about, are they joining this board because they have a passion, they believe in the mission, and they're going to be an active worker? Or are they doing it as a resume builder or just to see how many boards they can be on? Because there are some that believe that oh, well, you know, I shouldn't be the one as a board member doing the work. That's the staff's problem, or I shouldn't be doing fundraising. And I tell them all the time, there's a difference between for-profit boards and nonprofit boards. Your for-profit board is there to be in an advisory capacity. They're just to offer their insight, their advice. Nonprofit board, the expectation is that you're going to help sell that mission, whether that's opening your sphere of influence and inter making introductions or actively actually going out and soliciting for those funds. Um, so you have to make sure you're very clear on those expectations with potential board members before you even bring them into the fold. So I don't know if I if that was in a roundabout way, but there's a lot to cover with that. Boy, there really is. And I'm glad you, you shared that. And I think if there's definitely one takeaway, people who are currently serving on boards or aspire to make sure there is DNO insurance in place. I mean, that's, that, that is a standard question everybody should ask. And if you're a nonprofit board, you don't have it. You, you may want to get it. Exactly. Exactly. Highly recommend that. It's not very expensive at all. Yeah. I, I want to change the direction a little bit. Cause you referenced a lot about collaborations. I know you're collaborative by nature mm -hmm. and I'm just throw the question out there. Why should nonprofits collaborate? Well, the main reason that I think um, they should collaborate in this day and age is because um, there's more grant funding out there right now if they're going to seek that strand of revenue. Uh, we at the Community Foundation here in Marion County, one of the, things, the very first things we did at the Resource Center is we looked to see how nonprofits are bringing that revenue in. And in our community alone, only 2% had hired quality grant writers. But we knew that if you look out there statistically, I think one of them said $600 billion in grant funding is sitting out nationwide. And I'm thinking, why are we not helping these nonprofits pull that funding into our community for the betterment of our community? So we opened the grant services department here at the Resource Center. And what we do is uh, work with the nonprofit, first of all, to make sure, are they grant ready? We offer grant readiness courses to nonprofits that decide they want to learn more about what this looks like, um, maybe attempt to write the grants on their own, um, but we show them from start to finish what is necessary. Um, and in the grant readiness course, we offer something that we do um, here, which is grant scans. We have um, Dr. Jesse Brock, who works with us, and he has multiple platforms to be able to research what's available around the country for these nonprofits and then narrows that scope down. Um, but, you know, there's various services that either the nonprofits can take hold of with us. The grant scans tend to be the bigger ones because nonprofits typically will wanna try to write their own grants. If they can't write their own grants or they're not comfortable, we will actually work with them um, on a very reasonable fee basis. We don't believe in charging nonprofits, you know, they need that money for our community. We want to see that money stay here. The only thing we're asking is cover, you know, we got to cover some time here. Um, but we do grant writing. We do grant reviewing. We do grant administering and management. Um, so when we got into the grant space, it was interesting to hear some of the grant funders say they were looking for projects that had a very large kind of footprint and impact, right? And a lot of times, as you start building those collaborations and you submit for a grant with multiple partners in it, that's where you're going to see the biggest impact in a community. Funders like that because then they feel like they're getting a return on their investment, right? So 
we're seeing a little bit more of that. Um, we also encourage, you know, besides the grant side of it, just a nonprofit in the community in order to um, to help meet a need. And we did a um, nonprofit economic impact study um, last year to show the value that our nonprofits bring into the community from an economic standpoint. But one of the other things we discovered is there are multiple situations where our nonprofits are working together to solve a problem. And one of the scenarios we had um, pulled together was a, a mother of three small children that's in a domestic violence situation. And the nonprofits that came to get together to stabilize her over a six month period, um, the cost that is associated with those nonprofits coming together to solve that was somewhere close to $23,000. And that included the mother, the children and everything else. That's going on every day here in our community. Um, they're all talking to one another. How can we help address this issue? The collaboration is important. I think if we continue to encourage nonprofits, well, for this matter, even government, municipalities to work as silos, we're just going to be spinning our wheels. We've got to open that door to let's all learn to put our egos aside, right? And do it for the sake of the community. And I've always said, even in my position, if we need to bring someone together and they're not quite there, they're kind of like, it's uh, it's not going to give me the notoriety I want, then fine. You take the notoriety. I don't want it. If it's going to be better for the community, let's make the project happen so that the community wins. Um, but I think nonprofits are the same way. Everybody has something to offer. I had a, a food, um, a nonprofit that provides food uh, that said to me that they had a new donor walk in their door. They were talking to them about you know, oh, you know, this is the food pantry, but, you know, I'm really passionate in, you know, the areas of, you know, taking care of animals too. And, you know, do you take care of animals that are, you know, home with these homeless people? And she, it dawned on her at that point that she needed to open that door to that donor and say, let me introduce you to another nonprofit that has a program that helps homeless people have food for their animals. Because it sounds like this is where your passion is leaning. And I said, wow, you know, that's pretty interesting because I could have seen maybe in the past a leader saying, oh, I'm going to sway their opinion just to get that donation. But our nonprofits here in Marion County have learned that you're better off it, making those introductions to, to help a donor find their passion and working together because ultimately it's going to um, pay back for them in the end. Something is going to happen where somebody's going to do the same thing. Uh, so they're really, really supportive of one another here. Um, and I, I truly believe that is the thing that is going to make change, not only in Marion County, but if we get other communities to understand collaboration is going to be the key in order for us to kind of make some change. You know, I, I think you you really touched on something important there. Um, you know, I'm a, you, you come from the for-profit world. I came from the for-profit world. And so it's it's competition. That's good. It's healthy. It has its place. But when you move in the nonprofit space, that term collaboration, it's it's almost awkward at first. It's, it, it takes a long time to really appreciate what it really means and why, for the reasons you just stated, organizations should pursue it. Look, the, the issues are too big for yep. a single organization. Um, and it, it gives me great... Um, heartfelt warmth when I see organizations in our communities partnering. I wonder though, do you think board members struggle with that if they're from the for-profit space and they they come on to a board, a nonprofit board? I think those um, business leaders, those that join the boards that have a really strong for-profit business background struggle with a lot of different things. Because it's very foreign to them unless they are really, really into philanthropy. Like they were raised in philanthropy, but yet they've, you know, gone this way direction in the business, the for-profit business. Um, a lot of what the way nonprofits function as a business is just very foreign. Um, you know, I had, I remember years ago, there was an older um, gentleman that was a board member of mine that used to say stuff like, um, well, I don't understand. You just ask for it. Just pick up the phone and call. And I said, so let me ask you something. When you get that phone call in the evening and somebody's on the phone and they say, we want you to give, you know, $500 to da, da, da. 
I said, what do you typically do? He goes, I hang up on them. I said, exactly. I said, when you're fundraising and you're trying to sell a mission, the ask never comes on the right out of the gate. It's you got to get to know the donor. You got to know where the passion is. If their passion is not with the nonprofit mission, you got to bless and release them because you're only spinning your wheels. Um, but if you feel like they have grasped the mission, they're asking a lot of great questions, down the road, there's an opportunity to make an ask. But, you know, for-profit business is so used to like, here's the pitch, you got to sign up. Do you want the product? Do you want the service? Um, and like I said previously, there are some of those businessmen that don't understand that joining a nonprofit board means you're a working board member. You know, they'll say, well, I don't want to work any events. Okay, well, then, you know, clearly somebody didn't specify the duties and expectations of that nonprofit if, if that's the expectation. And I guess that kind of turns it around to back to what we talked about earlier about the expectations. I encourage every nonprofit that I work with to have some sort of duties and expectations um, document outlining everything that that board, you expect of that board member, but everything that that board member can expect of you. And when you are working your nominating process, what needs to go with that application, if you do an application for a board member, we we require it with a, a resume or a resume background. We always give potential board members our copies of duties and expectations. They can read it and make the determination. They they are going to be shocked when maybe a nonprofit has a duties and expectations that says, "Hey, we expect a four or five thousand dollar give get policy," meaning you're going to give something personally, but you're also going to help get and and get to that point. That's your commitment to us and the mission. Um, and then on the flip side, you know, they can understand that staff's role is that staff will be accessible to the board member. They will provide the documentation prior to the board meeting so that they have an opportunity to review. Um, so there's a, that is a huge part of making sure you're really functioning as a business. Nobody wants a surprise, right? Nobody wants to be surprised and find out you're part of something and find out that, oh, I've got to work a, a event or I've got to pay money. And, you know, so even the for-profit guys will say, well, you know, why do we have to personally give? And I said, because how are you going to go out and speak the mission and then ask somebody to give and then turn the table and you say, well, how much do you give? How are you going to answer that? I mean, some people could lie, I guess. I guess. <laughs> but I, I would rather be truthful and say, you know, I, I believe so much in this. This is this is how my wife and I or my husband and I or, you know, whoever we how we support the mission. Yeah. So you've really described uh, board member excellence and organizational excellence. And I think setting the right expectations for board members has got to be the key. Right. It starts there. And, and that would diffuse so many of the problems and challenges down the road when, when boards don't know. Oh, I, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Just that clarity up front. And I also think that type of stuff you're talking about, Lauren, demonstrates we got to act together. Yeah, We, we exactly. want to bring you on. We got a plan. We're going somewhere. And life happens and we get that. I mean, we have board members as well as other nonprofits and board members where, you know, you can't make the meetings, right? Or um, something personal has happened or something within your business. And, you know, I always encourage nonprofits to use a um, board member self-evaluation form, right? It's nothing that as executive director I need to see or my chairman of the board needs to see or anybody else. It's just something that gets handed out that allows you to kind of walk through the questions. Am I doing this? Am I doing this? And then you kind of grade yourself and say, maybe I'm not living up to the expectation. And maybe that's time for me to have a conversation with the board chair um, and just say, look, for now, I need to come off the board. Maybe you still have a passion and you want to do committee work that's a little bit more flexible. Great. But for a nonprofit to be successful, if the staff is going to be bringing 100%, they need that guidance from the board and the board needs to be willing to be give, give 100% for the sake of what you're trying to achieve, which is the mission of the organization. Yeah, absolutely. And there's nothing I, I, m probably more frustrating to a board member than seeing somebody that's not attending, not participating, not carrying his or her weight when you know when, when they're capable and or if they're busy, 
step off because exactly. it does it does create friction. You probably never hear about it, but it, it's noticeable. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. So, so, so Lauren, you, you've you've written uh, the 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 pamphlet, the book, if you will, the roadmap to, map to success. You told me you're in the process of updating it. As we bring this interview to an end, what what advice might you have for executive directors or for board chair to help them to continue down that path of excellence? So um, it's interesting. Um, it sounds a little strange to you. I, I believe you know there is work life balance, right? We all know that. But when you're working in nonprofit sector, I always say to the staff here, you know, respect the hustle, respect the hustle. I mean. When you really are latched on to a mission of an organization and how it's going to better the community, you get really excited about it. And that's where the hustle comes in. And I would say, number one, always continue to educate yourself and grow. Um, just like we spoke about earlier, professional development is huge for any any organization, any executive director, but also any of those upper level management staff um, to help develop them, invest in them. Make them, you know, grow in the organization. Now, they may not always stay in the organization, but you know what? There's a good possibility if the culture is right, they're going to, right? And you invest in in that. Um, and then from a, a board perspective, I guess, it's just, um, you know, just know your duties and expectations. Make sure the nonprofit is um, taking care of, you know, the insurance component. But understand that, when you join a nonprofit board, it's a commitment and it's, and it's real for the staff. They want you to take it seriously. Right. So think about it as this mission that you're, you know, something that you can really get behind and really work to make change in the community. Um, and, um, even it's important to educate the board, right? Things change. Things really change. I mean, no better did we see changes for the board than during COVID when, we had boards trying to do voting electronically and their bylaws didn't even have anything <laughs> in there. So we had to say to them, look, you know, you're kind of violating your own bylaws. <laughs> you better quickly figure out how you're going to fix it. So, um, you know, those things are important to stay on top of, right? Um, but the reality is in any business, whether it's for-profit, governmental, it takes structure, right? And the board is part of that structure. They have a responsibility, just like the staff has the responsibility. So that's the best thing to do is strive for that excellence. And ultimately, it all comes down to what's best for the community. The community is number one, in my opinion, whether it's for profit or a nonprofit. And we got to do what's in the best interest of our community and those constituents living here. So. There you go. The, the greater good and respect the greater hustle and, and do the right thing and, and love it. Lauren, I, I really appreciate this. Appreciate our time together today. Everybody, Lauren DiOrio, the president and executive director for the Community Foundation of Ocala, Marion County. Lauren, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. All right. We just heard from Lauren DiOrio. What a good interview. Uh, and she's just doing really nice work up in the Marion County, Ocala area. So read. This is Recapping with Reed, your three observations. Number one. Collaboration is huge for nonprofit organizations. If organizations work as silos, they're going to just be spinning their wheels because any issue is too big for just one organization to tackle. Typically, that's the case. And as a board member, you've got to recognize that. And that's really something different when you come from the for-profit sector. It, it takes a little while to learn and appreciate the power of collaboration. Reed, number two. Boards and organizations should properly prepare their board members by having some sort of duties and expectations document. And that's not only duties and expectations for the board member, but also from the organization to the board member, what is expected of the organization that the board member can rely on. Yeah, absolutely. Very good read. And number three. Professional development is huge in the nonprofit sector. Um, in order, you need to invest in your upper level staff and help them grow within the organization and within their role. Yeah, I think it's clearly a, a, a huge opportunity that we don't think about when we're serving on the board, but how are you making your CEO better? In the for-profit sector, you go to conferences, You, I mean, you have coaches. Why would you not do the same 
in the nonprofit sector. You're absolutely right. So there's three key points recapping with Reed when, uh, from our conversation with Lauren DiOrio. And we look forward to I-501 see you next week, the nonprofit, the podcast for nonprofit board members.